Dr. Phil Putt is Associate Professor in the Department of Cell Biology and Physiology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He earned his PhD in Psychology and Psychobiology. I don't think I've ever heard of psychobiology. You'll have to tell us what that is. Um, from the University of Virginia, and he did his postdoctoral training in the laboratory of Dr. Mark Baer, who is also um, doing a RET project right now. Um, Dr. Phil Pott published um, a very high profile paper in Nature in December of 2011, where he was able um, to um, show data where he was able to activate um, a silence gene um, in Angelman syndrome. And he's going to talk about that project and also talk about um, a project that is now being funded by RSRT. Um, it's a it's a 2.2 million dollar project um, that Dr. Philpott is doing together with Brian Roth and Terry Magnuson, and um, we're excited about it. And the goal here is to do similar things to what he did for the Angelman project, which is to activate the silent MECP2. So he's going to tell us um, how he is doing on that project, and he's going to give us an update on the Angelman project since that. Um, serves as kind of a model for, for the RET project. So thank you very much for taking the trip and coming. All right, first of all, um, thanks Monica for inviting me up. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you all for coming and also thanks to the Simons Foundation um, for uh, having us up and allowing us to be in this wonderful auditorium. I also want to reiterate that uh, we have the fortune, at least for those of you who are uh, here in the audience, to ask questions and interrupt me at any time. Uh, I really want to try to keep everyone with me um, in understanding the entire talk. So please, if there's something you don't understand and want a clarification on, just stop and ask me. Or if you have a question at any time, feel free to interrupt. Now, I want to reiterate um, some points that Monica made, that there really is a lot of reason to be hopeful um, that we might be able to develop therapeutics for Rett syndrome. And one of the ones that she mentioned is that it's a single gene disorder and the critical gene, MECP2, is known. And this is really important because if you think about it, the human genome contains about 25,000 genes. Right? And we know that these um, genes are found in uh, 23 chromosomal pairs, and the genes uh, the chromosomes uh, uh, contain DNA, the genetic material that encodes for proteins that perform cellular functions throughout your body. Okay. And most neurological disorders are caused by many genetic mutations, uh, which I hear represented on the chromosomes by little red dots. So you can imagine in schizophrenia there are thought to be many mutations that might make someone susceptible to getting schizophrenia. Okay. So as from a scientist's point of view, this makes it very difficult to tackle the disorder. You have to try to figure out what genes you want to focus your efforts on and what combinations of genes might be important for uh, causing schizophrenia. Now, in Rett syndrome, it's caused by the disruption of a single gene. Okay? And we know from the very seminal work of Uta Zogby uh, in 1999 that this is MECP2. So just knowing what the gene is gives us a tremendous advantage from a scientific perspective in trying to develop therapeutics. We know what gene to study and uh, what to go after. Now, another advantage for Rett syndrome is that the gr critical brain circuits remain grossly intact. And you can think that this is very different from the situation in late onset Alzheimer's, for example. So if you look, uh, compare a healthy brain to a brain from an individual with very advanced Alzheimer's, you can see that there's a lot of necrosis in the brain of the individual with Alzheimer's. You can imagine that overcoming the loss and physical damage of a brain is very, very difficult. So that's why for Alzheimer's, the focus right now is early identification. But in Rett syndrome, the gross brain circuitry appears to remain grossly intact. So here's uh, brain images. One is from uh, an individual with Rett syndrome, and one is from a neurotypical individual. Um, these are uh, called diffuser tensor imaging. Uh, they show um, fiber tracks in the brain. And I would challenge anyone here to uh, be able to tell the Rett brain from the neurotypical brain. 
So it turns out this one is, is, is the ret brain. Um, so uh, there are certainly differences that have been quantified. This is a, a group out of Johns Hopkins. They certainly quantified uh, differences in fiber tracts in individuals with Rett syndrome versus neurotypical controls. But I think um, it's still safe to say that even though there are things like microcephaly uh, that individuals with Rett syndrome have, the, the gross brain circuitry remains intact. And we don't see large amounts of neurodegeneration as you can see with things like late onset Alzheimer's. So this is another advantage that we have. So with this in mind, and also uh, um, with the important discoveries from Adrian Bird showing that even in, in an adult model of Rett syndrome, you can reverse the symptoms of Rett syndrome by uh, activating MECP2. Uh, we took on a, a drug discovery approach to find, try to find therapeutics for Rett syndrome. And this is a, a very uh, a large scale operation that's um, taking uh, investigators and their lab members with very different expertise. So my expertise um, is actually electrophysiology. Um, another member of the team is Terry Magnuson. He's an expert in genetics and he's one of the foremost leaders in the world on the X chromosome and X chromosome uh, uh, inactivation. And another team member is Brian Roth uh, from the phy from, uh, pharmacology department. And Brian Roth is the director of the National Institute of Mental Health uh, Drug Discovery Program. So he comes with an incredible amount of drug discovery expertise and facilities that are normally only found in a pharmaceutical setting uh, that we're fortunate not, enough to have at the University of North Carolina. Now, before I um, tell you uh, about the approach, I need to give you a little bit of a genetics 101 lesson. And I'll remind you that for everyone in the audience, that the genetic material in each one of the cells in your body is identical. So a cell in your heart and a cell in your brain and a cell in your eye, all of those cells have the same genetic material. But obviously you know that a cell in your heart versus a cell in your eye versus a cell in your brain, they're very different. And the reason they're different is through something that's kind of above the level of genetics, it's called epigenetics. And that's that only certain genes are expressed in these different types of cells. So you might have one complement of genes that are expressed in heart cells, while other genes are turned off, and a different complement of genes that are expressed in your brain cells. So, there are mechanisms in your body to turn on and off the expression of different genes. Okay. Now, in the case of the X chromosome, uh, things are a little bit different. So that's the case for um, you know, 22 out of your 23 chromosome, chromosomal pairs. But for the X chromosome, as Monica mentioned, there's such a thing as random X inactivation. So you can look at two cells in the brain and in uh, one cell, you might have one chromosome that's inactivated. In another brain cell, you can have the other chromosome that's inactivated. Okay? And obviously this has a huge impact when you start having mutations of, uh, uh, on the X chromosome. So with this, is that clear to everyone before I go on? Yep. Okay. So with this kind of genetic biology in mind that set up therapeutic strategy, we're using to try to develop therapeutics for Rett syndrome. So I'll remind you, in a neurotypical individual, um, MECP2 will be expressed off an active chromosome, but it doesn't matter which chromosome is active and which is inactive, because both copies of MECP2 are functional. So you have MECP2 protein expressed um, from a cell regardless of which uh, X chromosome is inactivated. Now, in the case of Rett syndrome, as you know, uh, there's a mutation in a copy of MECP2. So there's one copy that's mutated in every cell, which I'm uh, depicting the mutation just by an X. Now, in some cells, it doesn't matter because that's the inactive X, and the non-mutated MECP2 um, is active, so you still get normal MECP2 expression. In the other cells, it's the functional copy of uh, MECP2 that's silenced, right? And the active uh, copy of MECP2 is a mutated copy. So you don't get any functional MECP2 that's expressed. So it's in these cells 
that you don't have normal MECP2 function and that then do not have normal neuronal properties. So the therapeutic strategy is to find a way to activate the inactive copy of MECP2, the one that's silenced. So it really won't make a difference to the normal cells, they'll still express MECP2, but in the ones that have um, the good copy silenced, we'll now unsilence it and allow MECP2 to be expressed from those cells as well. And in that way, we'll reinstate normal function in those cells. So that's uh, the basic strategy behind our whole drug discovery platform. Is that clear to everyone? Okay. Now, can the inactive MECP2 allele be awakened as a treatment for Rett syndrome? Well, we don't know yet, but I can tell you by analogy to work we've done in Angelman syndrome that there is reason to believe that it may be. So I want to give you a little bit of background on Angelman syndrome and to tell you about that disorder and some of the progress we've made there because we're using uh, an almost identical strategy and applying it towards Rett syndrome now. So this is a face of an individual with Rett syndrome, a, a cute little uh, kid here with some jam smudged on his nose. And of course, there are many faces of Angelman syndrome. And immediately you can see one of the characteristic features of Angelman syndrome, and that's his very happy disposition. So one of the characteristic features of Angelman syndrome is a very happy disposition. Now, um, many of you may know that there's often a misdiagnosis between Rett syndrome and Angelman syndrome because they share a lot of phenotypic similarities. And so some of those are shown here. Um, so individuals uh, with Angelman syndrome have, sorry, uh, have uh, movement disorders, they have severe developmental delay, strikingly there's a severe speech impairment, so 70% of individuals don't speak a single word in their lifetime. Uh, there's a very high incidence of seizures, um, they have abnormal EEG patterns, and they also have severe sleep disorders. So uh, as you know, many of these features are shared with individuals with Rett syndrome, so there are a lot of phenotypic overlap. Um, just to bring you a little closer to uh, the disorder, uh, I wanted to show you a few videos that uh, were pulled off of uh, YouTube of individuals with Angelman syndrome so you can um, uh, understand a little bit more about the disorder. So uh, this is a, a little kiddo who's undergoing some, uh, or having some drop seizures. Um, and you can see that there are kind of some, uh, some stuffy toys uh, judiciously uh, placed around him as you'll see that uh, will uh, come into play as he kind of has his, his seizure and is, is falling over. So um, in Angelman syndrome, the seizures usually manifest somewhere around three years of age. Uh, and then there's a, a little bit of improvement um, with age after that. Okay. So you can see that seizures are, uh, are quite prevalent. Uh, another uh, Individual with Angelman syndrome is shown here, and you'll see um, kind of a, a common stereotypy, which is hand flapping. You'll also, I think, appreciate the really happy disposition of these individuals, and, and of course, um, the kind of a lack of uh, verbal communication. So I think this kind of captures the hand flapping and this really wonderful, uh, happy disposition of uh, individuals with Angelman syndrome. Now, I want to tell you about the drug discovery approach we used in Angelman syndrome and to give you a status update on that so you can appreciate how we're applying the same strategy towards Rett syndrome. And uh, a lot of the team members for this project were the same, uh, me and uh, myself and Brian Rosslab. Uh, for this project, um, we brought in Martin Zilka, who's a real expert um, uh, in genetics and molecular approaches and also uh, has a lot of expertise in the spinal cord, which we'll see uh, comes into play a little later. Now, the gene that causes Angelman syndrome just, uh, is known just as the gene that causes Rett syndrome is known. And the gene for Angelman syndrome is called UBE3A. Okay? So UBE3A is not on the X chromosome, but unlike most autosomal genes, UB3A is still only expressed, only has one active copy, okay? So in everyone sitting here in the audience today, you are expressing UB3A 
uh, in your neurons at least, from the copy you inherit from your mother, whereas the copy of this gene that you inherit from your father is silenced. Okay? And Angelman syndrome is caused when the copy that's inherited from the mother is mutated or deleted. So there's a loss of UB3A expression. So the drug discovery approach we used here is similar to the one that we're now applying to Rett syndrome, which is to try to find some type of small molecule compound which would turn on the inactive paternal copy of UB3A so that we could get expression from the normally inactive copy to replace the deleted copy and get expression similar to what we would in neurotypicals. Yeah? So I'm saying here though, you're turning, you would have both copies on, but one doesn't work. The, the, you turn, so you, could, you don't have to worry about turning one off. <clears throat> right, right. So in, in this instance, um, uh, we have a copy that's either deleted or non-functional um, so that we don't have to worry about turning it on. Now this, uh, you're actually asking a very insightful question. There are some forms of Angelman syndrome um, that have mutations uh, and in certain forms it might act as a dominant negative perhaps to alter the expression of normal function UB3A. It might be more problematic. But the majority of the cases of Angelman syndrome, uh, it's a large deletion. Um, that's causing it. Okay. So there might be certain types of Angelman syndrome that this strategy would not work in. Okay. So like Rett syndrome, you have different variables of mutations, where mm -hmm. Angel, Angel, Angelman's is a smaller number of mutations. Um, there, there's a smaller number of mutations that have been identified to date, but uh, there's still a lot of work that's going on to do that. Um, but you can imagine also in Rett syndrome, uh, there might be a few types of, of mutations uh, that might cause MECP2 to act in a dominant negative fashion, for example. So you might want to repress the expression of the bad one and activate it. Um, the hope is, and the expectation, is that most copies of MECP2 that are mutated will be non-functional. So even if they're activated, uh, it won't have a deleterious effect. But that's something um, that's very, it's a very important issue that will have to be addressed. And is that the difference between nonsense and mid-sense? Because nonsense, you still are producing a little bit of MEP2, perhaps? Um, I think it would be uh, uh, certain types of mutations that are not just uh, introducing a stop codon, for example, um, but can cause uh, MECP2 to act in an abnormal function. So yes, I mean, that, that's basically the, the point that will be very important to address. But like I said, the hope and the expectation is that for most MECP2 mutations that the strategy we're using will apply. Um, you can imagine studies in the future, for example, that will uh, look at very specific mutations of MECP2 and see if they act in a dominant negative fashion. There are ways to study this in a laboratory. So you can make the constructs with a specific mutation, express them in cells, and see how they act. Right? Yep. All right, so it turns out that the tools um, are in place for Angelman syndrome to look at genetic activation of UB3A. And the tool was developed by Scott Dindo when he was in Art Baudet's lab at Baylor. And he made a mouse that had a fluorescent reporter for gene activation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through this so hopefully it's clear. So um, they made, they fused to UB3A a yellow fluorescent protein, was YFP. So just think of it as just a fluorescent tag, okay? So you can make it so the mice inherit this fluorescent tag only from their mother, and that's shown here. So they don't have a fluorescent tag on the paternal copy. When you do this and then take a slice of brain and look in the brain, you can see the neurons are glowing yellow. Okay? So it shows you that the UB3A is activated. Now, if you breed the mice so they inherit the fluorescent reporter of UB3A from their father, and then you St look at a section of brain, you don't see any neurons that are expressing UB3A. Okay. And that's because that copy is silenced. So by using a fluorescent reporter for gene activation, we can distinguish between an active copy of the gene or an inactive copy of the gene. Okay. And this turns out to be a very, very valuable tool because we can culture neurons from mice that have the fluorescent reporter inherited from their father. So these neurons are not glowing fluorescent. Okay. 
Then what we do is we plate them in a 384 well plate. So this is just, literally it's a plate that has a bunch of little wells in it. And each one of these wells will hold about 20,000 neurons we take from mice. And all these neurons have a fluorescent reporter from their father. The idea then is that we add different drugs. We add them in quadruplicate. We add different drugs to all these wells. And we're looking for a set of four wells where all the neurons are glowing. If the neurons are glowing, we know that we've activated the paternal copy of UB3A. Okay? So this is how we do a drug discovery project. So we can screen for many, many different compounds and try to find ones that can activate our gene of interest. Okay. Now, I want you to appreciate um, the, the technology that goes into these drug discovery efforts. And this is really um, one of the many ways we benefit from the laboratory of Dr. Brian Roth. Um, as I mentioned, he's the head of the NIMH Psychoactive Drug Screening Center. Uh, not only does he have a lot of kind of genius in this area, but he also has a lot of the, the hardware and software necessary to do these large drug screens. So this is a brief movie um, showing you some of the uh, robotics that, are, that we employ uh, for adding drugs um, to different cultures. So you can see that with these types of robotics, they can pipette a lot of drugs out very quickly in a very precise manner uh, so that we can create many, many plates with neurons and screen for uh, drugs that are activators in them. So without this kind of million dollar piece of equipment and the expertise of Brian Ross Lab, uh, these studies would be um, you know, very, very laborious and time consuming uh, and really not practical to take on. So I think this allows you to appreciate just some of the technology uh, that goes into some of this type of research. All right. Now, one concern is that when you take cells out of a mouse and culture them, that they might behave differently. So one of the very first steps we did is just to take the neurons uh, out of the mice and to see if they still maintain the um, silencing of the UB3A just as they do uh, when they're in the brain. So this is an example of cultured neurons shown here. Uh, the stain on the bottom is a stain for nuclei, so it'll detect every single neuron in the dish. The stain on the top is our fluorescent reporter for UB3A. When we breed the mice, so the fluorescent reporter is on the maternal copy, then we see a lot of UB3A expression. When we culture the neurons from the mice where the fluorescent reporter is inherited from dad, even though we know there are lots of neurons in this field of view from this nuclear stain, none of the neurons are expressing UB3A. So we can culture neurons and we can maintain the ability to see whether the gene is on or off. Okay. So this is our, our first um, uh, kind of proof positive that this, such a screen will work. And in fact, with the Rett Syndrome Research Trust funding, we initially had a very, very small pilot project just to see if this would be even feasible for Rett Syndrome. Now, I wanted you to appreciate some extremely, uh, this, the raw data of what it looks like when we're doing these types of experiments, because I think it's important um, for parents to, to know the type of research that's being done and to even see a eureka moment that we have. Um, if you look at one of these 384 well plates that once again has a fluorescent reporter inherited from the father, we add different drugs in quadruplicate in the well. So this is just a blow up on just a small number of wells here. We had different drugs, so we might put uh, drug A here, uh, drug B there, drug C there. Always we use the first two lanes um, for something called DMSO, which is just a drug solvent. So just as water uh, can dissolve salt, DMSO dissolves drugs. Okay? So just to make sure that the, uh, we're not getting anything strange, that's just a control we always run. Okay? Now, the first thing I'm going to show you is once again, the stain for the nuclei of the neurons, because what we don't want is a drug that will kill neurons. Okay? So this is a stain from just a, a small subset of the plate here. And you can see that um, all these cells are healthy because we still have neurons. These ones are healthy, these are healthy, and these are healthy. But there are hardly any neurons in these. So that means that drug, that drug, and that drug all killed neurons. So that means we don't want to use these drugs because they're likely to have very high toxicity. Right? 
So that's one of the things we look for. The other thing we look for is just the increase in UB3A expression, because the only way we can get UB3A expression from the fluorescent reporter is if we unsilence this silent copy. Focus right on here. You can see there's one set of drugs, one drug that unsilence the paternal copy of UB3A. Okay. So that tells us that none of these other drugs work except this one right there, and that was our unsilencing agent. Okay. So uh, this truly was our eureka moment, and I can tell you that in our screen, we screened initially 2,306 compounds. So that's depicted here. Each one of these dots represents a different compound. Plotted on the y-axis is showing the increase in paternal UB3 expression, the unsilencing, and out of all of these compounds, only one of them unsilenced. Okay? So there are some other ones that look like they might have, but we retested those and those weren't real. Right? So out of 2,306 compounds, we found one. How long did it take you to get there? Um, this, so uh, is two years of very hard work to do that many. Um, one of the things that I was talking to Monica about today, she's uh, um, able to piggyback on this expertise that we've already developed. Um, so we're, out now allowed, we're now able to move much, much faster than we were when this original screen was done because we have a lot of the expertise. So it turns out one of the critical things is just culturing these neurons to keep them very healthy and to be able to put them in a 384 well format. So originally we only had one technician who was able to do this really well. And now we have uh, four or five who can do it really well. So it makes a huge difference. So that was one of the technical obstacles. Yep. Um, now, the, the great thing is that I've, I've learned about um, drug discovery is sometimes all you need is one hit to really be able to make some large inroads into scientific discovery. So it turns out that arena tecan is a compound that's known as a topisomerase inhibitor. These are FDA, it's an FDA approved compound and it's used to treat cancer, okay? So topisomerase inhibitors are probably the most common chemotherapeutics. Um, so there's good news and there's bad news. Some of the good news is that we already know how well these compounds are tolerated by individuals. So their health profile is very well worked out. We know what doses of them they can tolerate. We also know from having the unfortunate of watching an individual go through chemotherapy that they're not without side effects, okay? So these are compounds that do have uh, side effects. Okay. The other thing is once you have one compound that works, you can start looking at other compounds that are either structurally similar or that they hit the same molecular target. So even though we only got one compound through our screening process, we now have, I think, more than 30 different topisomerase inhibitors that are effective at unsilencing the paternal copy of UB3A. So this is just showing one of them. It's called Topotecan. It's another FDA-approved chemotherapeutic. Um, you don't see UB3A expression paternally with just a vehicle as a control. When we add this drug, we get huge expression. Okay. Don't worry about this. These data are just showing you that this is a compound that works at a very, very low concentration. And it's an advantage to have drugs that work at a low concentration because they're less likely to have off-target effects. Because as you know, if you take enough of anything, um, they're likely to have uh, negative side effects. Now, it's one thing to get a compound that can unsilence a gene in a dish, but can you have it unsilence a gene um, in vivo? Well, to look at this, we injected these compounds intrathecally, so into the spinal cord area. So uh, if anyone's um, had an epidural through childbirth, for example, this is the same route of delivery of the drug. Now, this is an image, just a small section of the spinal cord, showing you that there's normally no paternal ub expression, so there's not much fluorescence there. We know that there are a lot of neurons, because if you look at this neuronal marker, we can see many, many neurons. Now I'm going to show you an image after we've injected the mouse for two weeks with the drug. So we've injected the mouse for two weeks with the topisomerase inhibitor, and now you can see we have expression of paternal UB3A. Now, um, I want to point out, one of the things I want to do is point out many caveats 
of, and some things we're still uh, working on uh, and hurdles to overcome. And one of the things we looked at is how much expression of UB3A should we be getting? Do we want to target? Well, you can answer that question just by moving the fluorescent reporter so it's on the maternal copy. And you can see without drug, this is how much cop expression of UB3A we should be getting normally. So we still aren't there yet, but we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. Do you have to continuously deliver? I will answer that question next. The question was, do we have to continuously deliver the drug, um, or is the effect long-lasting? That's a great and very important question. I'm going to answer it in a, a slide, slide or two. Um, any other questions? Of, of the 2,300 or so drugs that you use, how, were all of those FDA approved, or are they used for other? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, of the compounds we screened, were all of them FDA approved? Um, our screening strategy, which is similar to the one we're going to be using for our RET screen, was to preferentially screen um, compounds that were already FDA approved. Um, that was one strategy. The other one is also to take ones that modify or are suspected to be able to modify the epigenome. And the other one is to take drugs that we know get into the brain well. And so all those have advantages. So um, if it's FDA approved, um, one, we know how well it's tolerated um, uh, just for health reasons. And we also usually know a lot about the molecular targets. Um, reason for using epigenetic modifiers are they're thought to modify uh, the expression of genes already. So those might be likely drugs to try. And then the reason for trying drugs that get into the brain well is that there's so many compounds that don't get into the brain well um, that you might as well start with testing ones that we do you know, get into the brain. Uh, so we'll get to the place where it's most important where we get them. So that's one of, one of the ways we shape the drug libraries um, that we're screening is just by trying to pick the ones judiciously because we can't go through a million compounds. It's just not practical with neurons. Um, so you appreciate a limitation. Uh, in many, most drug screens that are performed in pharmaceutical industries, they're performed on cells classes that can divide. So they just take cells, and they divide and divide and divide, and they can get as many cells as they want. And they can perform drug screens relatively easily on hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of compounds. Neurons do not divide. Okay? So to collect neurons for these studies, um, the unfortunate part of my job is that we have to sacrifice a mouse uh, and, and use neurons from mice. Uh, and we don't have the luxury of being able to use dividing cells. So you asked the, the really important question, is the unsciencing transient? And this is, question is important for a number of reasons, because if it's transient, you can imagine that you have to continually dose an individual with these compounds in order to maintain that gene activation. And if it's long-lasting, then you can have a much greater interval between dosing. Right? And for, especially for compounds that have toxicities, like topisomerase inhibitors, this would be completely impractical to give them frequently, right? Uh, so this is an important issue. We can answer this in a very, uh, very straightforward experiment. We take mice that once again have the fluorescent reporter on the silent copy. We give them drug for two weeks. Then we look immediately after drug, four weeks later, 12 weeks later, or 52 weeks later, so almost a year later. Um, I should say in these studies, we're using a, a very low concentration of drug because it allows us to quantify the neurons uh, more sparsely and in, an, and in an automated fashion. So these are raw data showing uh, spinal cord images where um, mice were treated with vehicle, so there's no unsilencing. Here are ones that were treated with topotecan, either immediately after two weeks of treatment or up to a year after treatment. And because this is a pretty striking effect, I'm going to show it bigger, um, that a year after we give mice topotecan for just two weeks, in a subset of spinal cord neurons, the gene we activated, UB3A, continues to be activated. Okay? Now, the, the, once again, there's reason for optimism and there's reason for caution. Reason for optimism is uh, a best case scenario would be we do a drug course for a limited amount of time and we have a permanent beneficial effect. Okay? Now, the, the caveats are that one, we haven't shown that we can 
have this lasting and silencing in brain neurons. So this is just spinal cord. We don't know if other classes can have this uh, you know, seemingly uh, permanent unsilencing. And so that's one caveat. Another caveat is that we are certainly affecting other genes. We're not just affecting the gene we're, we're measuring. Um, we are affecting other genes. And in the best case scenario, we'd affect the other genes transiently and our disease gene permanently, right? Um, so these are the types of things that we're looking at, at now. And uh, we have some, some insights that I can tell you a little bit about uh, uh, afterwards, if you're curious. Um, so once again, I wanted to remind you that there are limitations uh, to this approach and to where we are currently. Um, some of these limitations um, we could meet uh, when we're doing the drug discovery project for Rett syndrome. So we may or may not come up with the same limitations, but I wanted you to appreciate some of the things that uh, could arise. One is that um, our compounds are not the best at getting into the brain. So they do get to the brain, but not to the levels that we want. Okay? So our big push right now is to find compounds that get into the brain better. And we're lucky that we have a whole host of topi isomerase inhibitors that are now working. So we're kind of marching through those and seeing which ones get to the brain the best. Um, so if we don't get into the brain, it can limit our ability to get a good behavioral rescue, right? You need to unsilence a large portion of neurons to see a benefit. So we need to identify additional topi isomerase uh, inhibitors or other compounds that have better brain penetration. Uh, we're also continuing our drug screen, uh, at least for a little while longer, in the hopes that we're going to find something that's even uh, more innocuous than a topi isomerase inhibitor. You know, the best case scenario is find something that's as well tolerated as aspirin, right? Um, we're also working very hard to determine the mechanism, mechanism of action. So even if a topi isomerase inhibitor might not be useful therapeutically, if we can use this tool to figure out the mechanism by which it's unsilencing our gene of interest, we as scientists can then hopefully design very specific uh, treatment strategies to unsilence our gene of interest without affecting other genes. So by understanding the mechanism, we hope to gain insights. So what are we doing for MECP2? Well, we're nearly doing the identical type of screen. So I'll go back to this slide I showed you before. We're screening for compounds that can unsilence the inactive MECP2 allele. Okay? So we're doing the same type of drug discovery project. Now, we're fortunate to have tools in place, just as we did for Angelman syndrome, that will allow us to do this. This is a tool that was developed by Adrian Bird, who's uh, been funded through the Brett Syndrome Research Trust. So once again, this is kind of donor dollars um, doing valuable work. And he developed a fluorescent reporter for activation of MECP2. So just as UB3A was fused to a fluorescent reporter, he fused MECP2 to a green fluorescent protein. So uh, here, are you imagine our two brains, okay? Uh, you'd probably be hard pressed to guess um, which one has a fluorescent reporter, but if we fluorescently activated, turned off the lights and fluorescently activated them and, and imaged them in a certain way, you can see a brain is glowing, okay? So this is a brain that has the MECP2 fluorescent reporter knocked into it, okay? So once again, we can see activation of the gene by fluorescence, right? So is that clear to everyone? Okay. So, the screening strategy, I know this is a, is a busy slide, but I think you can appreciate the take-home message, is that we'll take mice and we'll mate a male mouse that has the fluorescent reporter. We'll mate them so the offspring, so remember these are XY, the females XX. The offspring of these, um, so oh, pointer's dying here. Let me move to the mouse. Um, some of these will, uh, males will not have any fluorescent reporter. The female offspring from this breeding pair uh, will have the fluorescent reporter for the MECP2 GFP. So through random X inactivation, half the neurons will express the fluorescent reporter and half of them 
the fluorescent reporter will be on the inactive X, right? Because we only have the, they're only inheriting the fluorescent reporter off of one X allele, right? So half the neurons are expressing the fluorescent reporter and half of them it's silenced. So what we're doing, we're taking this population of neurons, we're adding small molecules, and we're trying to make the inactive MECB2 allele active, which will detect by an increase in fluorescence, right? So once again, we have a population of neurons uh, that's mixed, that have fluorescence and don't, and now we're trying to make it through adding drugs so that all the neurons are expressing fluorescence. Right? It's a very straightforward concept. Trying to make all the cells green. Okay? Yeah. And these, are, these still don't have mutations, right? We're nothing to do with mutations at this point, okay? Right now, we just want to find ways to activate uh, the inactive X. Uh, well, I should say the inactive MECP2. Okay? What we won't know um, and one of the later stages of the drug discovery process is to see how specific these compounds are. So for example, we could totally inactivate, uh, activate the inactive X, or it could be very specific for MECP2. Um, but that's a later stage of the discovery process. The first stage is let's just find compounds that will be able to unsilence the inactive MECP2. Right. So the Kind of the dream of what we hope to do is depicted here. Um, so you can imagine two unhealthy neurons, and they're uh, uh, somewhat unhealthy because they have a mutated MECP2 and then an active um, good copy of MECP2. And what we hope to do is to find compounds so that we can treat these neurons so that the drugs come in like a flurry of snowflakes, and they'll unsilence the healthy MECP2 copy and then they'll make the neuron healthy. Right? So that's really the dream of, of what we hope to do. Now, um, I should, uh, of course, point out um, that this work is done by a large team of experts that uh, really, um, I think most laboratory investigators will tell you that they're, they're nothing without the people in their laboratory and their collaborators, and the same is very true for me. Um, this is my team of researchers in my lab, um, and I've been fortunate to receive uh, funding for the Angelman Syndrome Project, both through the Angelman Syndrome Foundation and through the Simons Foundation. And this is another example of the importance of parent organizations and private foundations for providing money that can really advance research in a powerful, very powerful way. And for this project, I've been uh, funded by the Rett Syndrome Research Trust, and, and obviously that um, wouldn't be possible. It's my only source of funding for this project at the moment. Uh, we actually, the, the team uh, of researchers working on this project, we met just yesterday for um, an update report. Um, uh, I unfortunately took the picture after some of the team members had left, uh, but these, this is the team um, of members. Uh, um, Brian Roth is the director, once again, of this drug screening center. Um, and Terry Magnuson is an expert um, in uh, X inactivation. But this is a team of researchers that allows us to do, uh, collect the neurons and to screen drugs for unsilencing. And then we'll, uh, you know, once we have active hits, then we'll validate those and try to move those forward in, in a very uh, careful and methodical way. But once again, I'd like to thank Monica and the Rett Syndrome Research Trust um, for funding my research and, and for all of you for um, supporting that as well. And uh, I thank you for your time and attention. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I have a, a statement and two non-scientific questions. Yeah. Uh, first statement is thank you. I think a bunch of us in this room have uh, daughters affected with Rett syndrome, and you are you and your team are uh, a major source of. Yeah, so thanks. Thank you. No, thank um, you. First and foremost. Um, the two questions I have is given the fact that, um, that it's single gene, 
and given the fact that the gross motor um, brain, whatever it's called, is, is intact, um, is that a reason for scientific researchers to flock to this field? And is there like a recruitment process that, that goes on within the scientific community to find people to get on board? Mm -hmm. So, so the question is, given the tractability of Rett syndrome um, for possibly developing therapeutics, does that uh, encourage scientists to study this area, and does it encourage, and, do, and how do we um, generate interest in the next generation of researchers as well, right? Um, so I think uh, it really is a reason for researchers to flock to the field, and um, I think since the really important discovery from Uda Zogby in identifying MECP2 as being the relevant gene, there's been a, a huge influx of researchers, and really top researchers um, in neuroscience are in MECP2. And one of the things I talked to Monica about recently is that in many ways, the research in Rett syndrome uh, is outpacing many other neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, to date, it's the only, at least as far as I'm aware of, it's the only um, uh, uh, so-called neurodevelopmental disorder, and I'll use that term loosely because people would argue whether Rett's neurodevelopmental or not, but it's the only neurodevelopmental disorder uh, that has mouse models where you can conditionally delete um, or reintroduce MECP2, the gene of interest. So you can study the critical period for when the gene needs to be expressed in a very um, concrete way, at least in mouse models. Uh, and some of these tools um, really have pushed um, the MECP2 field forward. Uh, there are other tremendous researchers um, such as Michael uh, Greenberg and also Michael Green who are working um, very hard to figure out the mechanisms uh, by which uh, MECP2 is working and gene unsciencing might occur. And Adrian Bird who's created a lot of powerful tools. Um, I could go on and on, uh, but the, the message of hope for you is that really some of the, the best and brightest minds have, I think, already turned to studying uh, Rett syndrome. Uh, as far as training the next generation, uh, I think just getting um, young graduate students and probably more importantly postdocs, uh, um, postdoctoral fellows studying Rett syndrome, the more likely there are to be future uh, interest in it. Because most postdoctoral fellows often do research that's very similar um, when they get their own laboratory. It's very similar to what they did as a postdoctoral fellow. Um, so I think you know, one of the ways you can support the future of Rett syndrome researchers is by making sure postdoctoral fellows are, are funded and working in labs, working in, in Rett syndrome. Can I expand on that for a minute? So, Jeremy, you asked also, um, you know, is there a recruitment process in place? And, you know, I, I think that falls on the advocacy groups um, in part, like, like RSRT. I mean, it, it's what I spend um, some of my time doing. And f for example, Ben, I, I, I heard that he was doing, that he had this Angelman screen going and that there were encouraging results yeah. a year or two before he published because um, I'd heard about his work and contacted him and asked more about it. and asked him whether he thought he could do the same thing for Rett syndrome, and now he's got a $2.2 million grant from us. So Michael Green, same thing. Um, I'd heard about his work, invited him to a meeting, um, and now he's working on Rett syndrome. It, it took a while. It took three years. Um, but So I, I think it's really the advocacy groups. One of our responsibilities is to stay up to date on who's doing what. And when we hear about synergistic work, um, and we hear about that through a variety of ways. It could be because we go to a meeting and hear about it, we read a paper, um, or we have a network of people that are going to meetings and are reporting back. So our key advisors and, and people that we work with and people that we fund, they go to a lot of meetings. And when they hear something interesting, they let me know about it. So um, I, I really think it's a key responsibility of ours to keep up to date. And when there are people doing synergistic things that have synergistic tools, or that are or doing projects that are relevant, we get in touch with them. And um, they've heard about RET typically. RET's a pretty high profile disorder. I mean, they, they know about it. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of um, scientists that are not, you know, it's not going to necessarily happen naturally. Um, they've got a lot of things going on in their lives. They're trying to get money. They've got a lot of projects. They're publishing. They're going to meetings. Um, you know, there's a lot of distractions. So we can't count on them saying, hey, this might be relevant to Red. It's really us who has to go to them. So you're absolutely right. There does have to be recruitment. Um, so. 
because UB E3A is not on the X chromosome, did you have to consider, are you considering a different palette of drug library? Uh, how are you addressing that or, or do you specifically address that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So the question is because UB3A is not on the X chromosome, are we using a different library of drugs when we're doing the, uh, the RET screen? Um, and the answer is that we're using very similar um, drugs in the RET screen, but we're using a, a, um, a, a larger number of, we're screening a larger number of compounds for the RET screen uh, than for the Angelman syndrome screen. And uh, one of the reasons is um, that this type of screening is unbiased. So you're not going in with really a, a preconceived notion of what compounds might work. And I used to be a little bit of an, un, kind of a, maybe a, you know, disbeliever in uh, um, using an unbiased screen because it's also kind of a code word for not hypothesis driven, right? You're searching for something that's out there. And I can tell you that we start off the Angelman syndrome screen using a very biased approach where we are taking our, our best scientific knowledge and trying to take our best guess about what compounds might work. And all those failed miserably. I mean, none of those compounds worked. And it really wasn't until we tried this unbiased screen that we were able to find compounds that worked. And I can tell you that, uh, boy, topoisomerase inhibitors would probably be one of the last things on my list I would have tested if I had just gone through kind of my rank ordered my candidates. And, um, you know, when we initially found the, that as a hit, um, we had no idea why it was working because it was very, it just was just not intuitive to us. Uh, now we've studied it more and the mechanism is starting to make a lot more sense, but I think this shows the power of using an unbiased screen to look for compounds. I think this question was asked to some degree, but um, I'll try to ask it again. Um, so in, you're trying to activate MECP2 that is not working. What are you going to do about the one that is there and is mutated? Because well, as yeah. far as I understand, if we have two of them in the body, it may cause problems. Don't, do we need to study in parallel silencing? Yeah. So, so the question is, um, uh, in activating uh, MECP2, we'll be activating both the functional copy and the non-functional copy. Um, and is that, uh, does a problem arise because of that? Um, the, the hope and the expectation is, is that most of the mutated copies of MECP2 will not be functional. So even if they're unsilenced, they're not going to be doing anything detrimental. So really what we're going to be doing is activating uh, the functional copy, and that's really what's going to be expressed. Now, we have ways of testing that um, in that we can make constructs of different MECP2 mutations and then uh, overexpressing those and seeing if they impair the normal functions of MECP2 of a, of a wild type or, or normal functioning MECP2. So you can scientifically test that. Um, the strategy that uh, we're taking is first just to identify compounds that can do unsilencing. Um, and then we can look at the effects that those might have after that. Because you can imagine there, there are hundreds of different mutations that have been associated uh, with Rett syndrome. And testing all of those uh, could be really hard and long. But first we want to see if we're justified and have reason to start testing those. And that's why we just want to see if we can get unsilencing. But like I said, the hope and the expectation is that most of the MECP2 will not be, the, the mutated MECP2 will not uh, functionally impair the regularly functioned MECP2. Yeah? So that seems like a, an essential difference between Angelman's and Rett's. Are there any other essential differences? I mean, it, it, I mean, from your presentation, it looked like the methodology would basically be the same, but are there other things about Rett that would be so different? That is either from a drug discovery approach? So the question is, are there differences um, from a drug discovery approach between the RET screen um, and the Angelman syndrome screen, right? I guess I'm asking more of like a comp, this is almost sounds like when you have the idea with, with RET that you have that mutated MECP2 also in the body that you activate. It seems like almost like an extra complication with RET that wouldn't be an Angelman. Is, are there other either extra mm -hmm. complications with RET versus mm -hmm. Angelman or things that is, almost better about red than Angelman's
Yeah, um, so basically it's the, the dif differences we might encounter in the drug discovery and the treatment process between Angelman syndrome and Rett syndrome. Um, oh, there are also individuals with Angelman syndrome who have uh, um, point mutations, for example, kind of analogous to what you have uh, with Rett syndrome. Um, so the, the bigger, I think the, one of the bigger issues, well, there are many issues we'll face, but um, it might be drug specificity. So compounds that uh, unsilence MECP2 have the potential, perhaps, to unsilence you know, the, the whole inactive X. And not much is known about what happens when you, when you activate these. I think that's one of the reasons for, for, for funding and, and studying what Michael Green is doing. Um, but with that said, we still might uh, find that we have tremendous specificity in compounds. We just don't know. So we might find that um, through a biological uh, kind of whim, we might find that we can get compounds that are highly specific to uh, MECP2. So we are very surprised, um, even though these topoisomerase inhibitors that we're using for Angelman syndrome certainly hit other genes, they're not affecting um, as many genes as we might have anticipated. And there, there's some specificity that we've uh, kind of figured out why they're targeting certain genes or not. So I. I I'm not going to give you a very satisfying answer to your question, but a lot of it is going to be we just have to see what we encounter when we're doing the studies. Um, but if we can't unsilence MECP2, then it's, it's a moot point. So that's why we, we start there. Uh, let's see if we can unsilence it with compounds um, that don't have toxic side effects. And if we can do that, then we, then we move on to the next stage. Are you able to disclose the funding that you had for the Angelman? Yeah, I can disclose the funding for the Angelman Syndrome Project. Um, I think I got an initial uh, $200,000 seed grant from the Angelman Syndrome Foundation. Uh, then I was fortunate to get um, a greater than $1 million grant from the Simons Foundation. Uh, and those were really the, the main sources of funding that uh, drove the, the drug discovery effort. Um, so. Um, I, and then we also had an anonymous donor that came in and gave a fairly generous amount of money. But um, you know, they're multi-million dollar endeavors to do a screen like this. Yeah, yeah. So um, to date, I think uh, we've screened um, 4,000 compounds for the Angelman Syndrome Project. Uh, and as I mentioned, that um, uh, you know, for the RET project, we get to piggyback on the technology that we've already developed for the Angelman Syndrome project. So things are already moving faster and, and more smoothly for the, our RET study um, compared to uh, the bumps we hit along the road for the Angelman Syndrome project. Have you started testing drugs. Yeah. So the question was, have we started testing compounds? And we've um, screened about uh, a thousand compounds so far already. So we're already, um, you know. We, we screened almost half the amount of compounds as we did for our original Angelman syndrome study already for the RET project. So um, we're, we're making much, much faster progress than we did for the Angelman syndrome project, just through the, the kind of the knowledge and technical expertise we, we gained from that. Yeah. Can you share if you found any success yet? So the question is, have we shared? Can I share if we found any successes yet? Um, uh, I, I can't share simply because it's too early uh, to know because. Um, in the drug discovery process, there are a number of ways you can have um, false discoveries. So one of the ways is if a drug itself has fluorescence, and it turns out that some compounds are fluorescent, um, and you need to make sure that you're not getting a fluorescent signal just from the drug being fluorescent. And we can tell this by putting the drug on neurons that don't have the, fluorescent, the gene fluorescent reporter. And if they're still fluorescing, then we know that the fluorescence is coming from the drug itself. Um, so we've screened. Um, uh, a large number of compounds, but we need to do um, secondary work on, on anything at this point. So there's no point in really mentioning anything at this point. Yeah. Uh, from what you said, it seems that there is also a lot of work after, to, to, to do after you discovered something. Yeah. Do you expect to do it in your lab, or do you think it will be a different yeah. lab? Than so the, the question is, there's a lot of work to do after you have targets. Um, and do we expect to do that in our lab or different labs? And to answer that, it depends a little bit about um, what we find. Uh, but the initial validation of the drugs we'll all do in our lab. So if we find um, a drug that uh, works in our fluorescent assay, 
We then make sure it's not due to just the drug being fluorescent. Then we test it by um, testing for protein levels. So you want to measure that's a secondary validation, so you don't want to just use a fluorescent readout. You want to measure protein levels of MECP2. Um, that will all do in our laboratory consortium of the laboratories. Um, we'll also try it in vivo, so we'll try it in mice, and that will also do within our laboratory. Other work we can do within our laboratories um, is to see uh, how specific the compounds are. So now, um, you may or may not be aware, but it's really uh, cheap and quick to um, you know, do a lot of sequencing of, the, of proteins that are being expressed. Um, and that can be done very rapidly. So we don't just have to look at whether MECP2 levels are changing, but we can look at essentially every protein that's expressed in neurons in the brain and see if their levels are, are changing. So we'll study the specificity of any compounds we might find. So are they just affecting MECP2? Are they affecting every gene in the body? Are they affecting hundreds of genes? That we can all do in our, in our laboratory group because we have that technology. Uh, Terry Madison's group is also an expert in uh, X inactivation, so they can also look at some of the me mechanisms of how drugs might be acting. Are there histone modifications that occur? Are there changes in DNA structure? Um, so those types of experiments we can do in our laboratory. There are other types of experiments um, that depending on exactly where the project takes us, we may or may not do in our laboratory. So something that's typically done is um, pharmacokinetic studies, whereas you give a drug and you see uh, how well it gets into the brain. So we can do some of those studies, but those are also things that we can outsource to groups um, that could be better at it. Uh, we can do behavioral rescue in our study, but maybe we want to outsource that to another, you know, collaborate with another laboratory who might be better at that. So just depending on where we are and how things are going, um, uh, you know, one of the things I, I think I'm pretty good at is uh, staying within our group's level of expertise, and we think someone else has a better expertise, then we seek those people out. Right. Um, and one of the things uh, the, the grant has set up is that we report uh, regularly um, uh, to the Rett Syndrome Research Trust about our progress, and we talk about uh, how we might want to alter the study um, and what directions it should go in. And one of the things that, um, that Ben and I were talking about today is the importance of you know, keeping the screen going while, while starting to chase whatever hits may come. Because, you know, from our perspective, we don't want to get too sidetracked on chasing the hits. And it's important to see what all the hits are, because then you can prioritize them. There may be some that are more tractable than others. You know, in kind of the same vein as when we were talking about Monica Justice's modifier screen. I want to see the whole list. I want to see what that list is, and let's prioritize it. Because there may be some genes in pathways that we know a lot about. And until we know what the full list is, it's hard to prioritize. So, you know, Ben and his group are going to have to balance that and, and do as much in parallel as possible. Follow up on the, on the hits while continuing to do the screen as quickly as possible so we have the full list of, um, full list of hits. Yeah, so the question is, um, uh, would this go along with the, the other study that's looking at modifier gene expression? Uh, they're, they're really quite distinct uh, because our, our primary measure is whether we're changing MECP2 or not, whereas that screen is looking for other genes whose expression levels can overcome the deficiency in MECP2. So, but would you see something? Would you see a modifier? I mean, you would want to concentrate on that, but would you know? Yeah, it, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't come up from our type of screen. It wouldn't show up. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. They're different, but, different Yeah. But, um, it, you know, th there are ways to imagine overlap. Uh, so, for example, if there are certain genes, um, well, th there are possible ways to imagine overlap, but they're really distinct studies. Can you describe the tangible things that you're doing now with your Eureka moment? Has it gone to rats? Has it gone to mice? Yeah. So, what, what stage are we at? And when was it again? The Eureka moment in the laboratory, uh, boy, I, I should know this. Um, I think it was 2009. I don't remember the exact date. Uh, the paper was published um, online in December of 2012. Oh. 2011, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, 
the, we're not at clinical trials yet. So we have, we have some real obstacles that we need to overcome for, before we'd even attempt this in clinical trials. So we haven't even attempted in our laboratory to get behavioral rescue in the mice. The reason is, is that when we deliver the compound, we're not unsciencing that many neurons throughout the brain. So when you, when you do it in culture, we get, every single, we get every single neuron, essentially. When we deliver it into the brain, uh, we're getting unsilencing near our site of delivery, but the spread of it in the brain isn't very good, and the compounds get extruded out of the brain very rapidly. Okay? So one obstacle is getting compounds that both get into the brain well and then don't get extruded by mechanisms the brain has to do this. Um, another obstacle is the specificity of these compounds. So I mentioned that you certainly you know, know and have seen individuals go through chemotherapy. We know that these are compounds that have toxicities associated with them. So um, we know that there are health risks. So we would only even consider using these compounds if they're efficacious kind of below the levels that they're used for as a chemotherapeutic. If it's above that level, I don't think we want to go there. Um, I also mentioned that we know we're turning on other genes, uh, sorry, or altering other genes. I shouldn't say turning on, in most cases it's turning off. Um, other genes that we don't want to be affecting, right? And these compounds are affecting them. The question is, are those uh, long-lasting effects or not? So we know how well these drugs are tolerated from how they're given to individuals with cancer. So we know that someone can be treated for a cancer, can go through you know, a really rough time through chemotherapy, but there are also success cases where after that, they can live a long, full life afterward without adverse effects. So we know to a certain extent these compounds are tolerated, um, but at really high concentrations they're not. So these are the types of things we're still battling through to develop therapies for Angelman syndrome. So at the moment we have a large battery of compounds that can unsilence UB3A. They're all topoisomerase inhibitors, but we have over 30 compounds, um, many of which are purported to have very good um, brain penetrants and very low toxicities. So one of the things we're finding is that a lot of companies are contacting us, are kind of coming out of the woodwork, saying, look, we have this topoisomerase inhibitor. We are developing it for this certain type of cancer. Um, and we know it's really, really safe. But unfortunately, it didn't work for this certain type of cancer better than the existing drug. So it didn't go anywhere for our company. But we know it's safe. We know it gets into the brain. Can you try it for this? So we're now having a lot of pharmaceutical companies uh, wanting us to test their compounds. And we've recently just signed a contract with one to test some of their compounds. Um, I should say a secondary benefit of this screen, even if we don't, well, there, there are a number of secondary benefits. Even if these compounds never make it to clinical trials, and, and I would be the first to say that I'm, I'm dubious if they might, right? Um, I wouldn't try to oversell it. But we now are learning a whole lot about the mechanism by which UB3A is getting activated. And by that academic insight, I hope that we can develop more specific and safer strategies for unsciencing UB3A. Um, the line of research has also inspired many other laboratories to really reinvest in this approach. Um, I, should, I should point out that I was not the first to think of um, uh, unsilencing UB3A as a strategy to treat Angelman syndrome. In fact, there are clinical trials um, out of Baylor uh, from Art Baudet's group and others where they tried to use kind of folic acid treatments to try to uh, change UB3A expression levels. Um, so other people have, had tried this, this strategy in, in targeted clinical ways. Um, but now there's this renewed interest from a lot of different laboratories that, hey, we can activate UB3A. We just need to find more specific and safer ways to do it. So even if I'm not the one to do it, um, there are a lot of other laboratories that are now working on it and also applying the strategy we use there to other disorders such as Rett syndrome. Does that answer your question? Okay. I, I'm so impressed with the <laughs> really great questions. Yeah. So you guys really understand the science yeah. well. Um, so I think um, I, I, one take-home message that I that I hope you're going to leave with is that um, you know there are a lot of strategies um, that are being pursued, and I think there's a, a, a lot of reason for optimism. Um, this is not a field where we're scratching our heads and thinking, God, you know, what could we be doing? There, there's a there's a lot of approaches. 
Um, so I want to thank, um, thank you. Ben for making the trip today. Thank you.